Hi guys, as always, we're going to move into a new physical problem involving a particle moving in one dimension. We're going to look at the classical picture and the quantum picture and see what we get between the two. Today's lesson is quite interesting because for the first time, we're going to go into these ideas of discrete energy value, something we take for granted in a lot of physics courses. And our problem involving today is what we call the unsymmetric infinite square well, and it's set up like that. We have a particle of mass m confined to moving the potential as given as v in terms of x as plus infinity from x greater than 0, 0 for x between 0 to a, and plus infinity for x greater than a. I've sketched out the potential over here as you can see. It's called unsymmetric because it's actually symmetric but it's moved out of the origin position. Now the width of the well is from 0 to a, and all we need to know is that it's infinite outside the region of the well. So in this region and this region, x less than 0 and x more than a is infinite, so the potential goes up to infinity. Infinity. Now let's see what we get. Now the classical picture, we can immediately say that the particles confined inside the well. No surprise about that. For 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 classical, sorry, for a particle in the classical picture to exist, we know that the kinetic energy is always greater than zero. So as the particle moves inside this region, the energy of the particle will become e minus v, and since v is infinite, it will drop to a negative energy. It will be reflected and travel to the right. Same thing will happen when it moves in this region, reflected and travel to the left. So the particle is basically trapped inside here. It has no right to be inside this region. So over here, the kinetic energy needs to be more than zero. I can also say that the momentum p is equal to plus minus square root of 2 me, basically just using equations of momentum and e equals to half mv squared. No restrictions on e, so basically no restrictions on the momentum as well. Now, what do I get in the quantum picture? Now, the first thing that I want to say, and this may be a bit hard to accept for now, is that the wave function is equal to zero outside the boundary. This statement can parallel the statement of the particle being confined in a well in the classical sense with the exception of the wave function because inside the well we know we also got this probabilistic determination of where the particle is that's why we need a wave function but i can also say that outside the well the wave function is equal to zero also implying that even though we are in the quantum picture the particle has no right to be in these regions where the potential is equal to infinity now if you remember the idea of the potential step, we talked in passing something about the energy of the particle being to infinity and the potential being finite. But if that's the case, since the energy of the particle is infinity, a finite potential is not strong enough to, to stop or to reflect the particle as it enters that potential. So there's this total transmission of particles because it's infinite energy compared to a finite potential. In this case, the, the, the idea is reversed. Now we will have a particle with finite energy. Okay, let me just uh, erase this EK because I don't want to com complicate matters. We got a particle of finite energy and the potential is now infinity. So the potential is very strong uh, compared to the finite energy of the potential. And when that's the case, we will have the idea of total reflection of particles as opposed to total transmission. Since the total reflection as the particle enters this region, the wave function will equal to zero immediately and the particle will be reflected back. So some things in classical physics and in quantum mechanics are different, but some things are also the same, and it, this happens when we are dealing with the infinite uh, square well potential. So we will look at the solutions inside the well. Again, why? Because wave function is equal to zero outside the boundary. So we only need to see how the Schrodinger equation regulates the motion of the particle in this region over here. I've written down the, the Schrodinger equation, rearranged it to get this form, and you know, again, what we will always do is that we will let k squared equal to 2me divided by h bar, uh, h bar squared, we will replace this with uh, k squared, and once I do that, immediately just write out the solutions. No need to meddle anymore with whatever constants because we've got the k squared here, we know what k squared is, write the solutions, so the solutions will be psi x equal to a dash e i k x plus b dash e minus i k x. Now, why is it a dash? Let's we'll see why in a minute. I want to write these solutions in another way for reasons why we'll see so in, uh, very soon. It's kind of linked to the discrete energy spectrum because really I want to apply the boundary conditions, right? I didn't mention that it's a boundary condition because it's at the boundary. The motion is at the boundary. So what is the form I want to write this solution as? I want to write it in terms of trigonometry functions. Now I know that the E i kx will go into the cosine kx plus i sine kx. I'll do so for the same over here, but for the cosine functions, the minus sign can be absorbed. So I'll get an a dash plus b dash, and I will get a cosine kx. And after that, I'll plus the imaginary part. The imaginary part will be a dash minus b dash, and a sine kx. Because when I get a sine, sine minus kx, so when I bring it over, it becomes a minus sine. And once I do this, what I will can write now is I will write an a cosine kx plus b sine kx 
where A and B can be real or complex. Okay, real or complex. Now, we did not go into this idea of the constants being complex at the moment because that would really take the formal generalization of quantum mechanics. But just as a suggestion, as you can see, there's an imaginary part over here. I multiplied by A dash minus B dash, I can just basically, you know, lump that into a uh, complex number B. Now, very quickly going through, the formal generalization of quantum mechanics is in the Hilbert space. We're not going to the Hilbert space, but solving the Schrodinger equation involves solving the eigenvalue problem of the Hamiltonian applied to the cat equals to E multiplied by the cat. This is, and you know, we know that the cat psi is the eigenvector. However, in the Hilbert space, Scalars in the Hilbert space are known as complex numbers, or they can be complex numbers. It's also to regulate the, the, the case of quantum mechanics. So what we actually have is that since the, the psi, the cat psi is the eigenvector, we know that alpha multiplied by the, the cat psi is also an eigenvector, where the, the A alpha, which is scalar, can also be a complex number. And because you know that this is a linear uh, position of two solutions, the Schrodinger equation is a second order linear differential equation, we can also superimpose the solutions. But the idea here is that if this is a solution to the eigenvalue problem, which is what we're solving over here, this is also another solution when alpha can be complex, is what I'm just doing over here. Now, I want to write it in this form because I want to apply the boundary conditions. Now, what is the boundary conditions? The boundary conditions comes from this idea that the wave function is equal to zero outside the boundary. So in this case, where x is equal, x equals to zero, psi evaluated at zero is equals to zero for the case at the at the potential at equals infinity. Same situation when I would evaluate psi at a, right? Okay. But now I got the solutions of the Schrodinger equation that involves a particle inside the well. So I can now apply the boundary conditions and put values of x equals to 0, x equals to a into the solutions of the Schrodinger equation. Let's start with psi evaluated at x equals to 0 equals to 0. So psi 0 equals to 0 would give me, I put 0 inside here, sine 0, you know, with 0, put 0 inside here, we get an a, so I will get a is equal to 0. Okay, so I'm sorry, put 0 inside here, cosine k0 is 1, so a is equal to 0. That's the first one that I get. Now, psi evaluated at a equals to 0. What do I have now? I put a inside these two as per usual, so I will get a cosine ka plus b sine ka is now equal to 0, right? But because of the first condition, which is a equals to 0, I cannot eliminate this, this part of, of this condition. And when I do that, let's see what do we get. We get this solution over here. B sine Ka is equal to zero. Now, we know that we set the, the constant of the Schrodinger equation as K. K squared is equal to 2Me divided by h bar. But now we know that there's a restriction on K. Why is there a restriction? Because K must obey this equation over here based on the boundary conditions. We apply the boundary conditions to the Schrodinger equation, we need to obey this condition. Now as you know that this can also be written as sine Ka is equal to zero, just divide B. And what do we get over here? So this is simply solving a trigonometry function. Who thought that getting the discrete energy values was boiled down to solving a trigonometry function? In fact, this only applies when Ka is equal to an integer multiple of pi, when I, n equals to 0, 1, 2, so on and so forth. Now, can you see that? This solution, boundary conditions apply that we get this equation over here. Solving this equation, we get this over here. And now I know that k would have to take only certain values. The values are basically the, the multiples, integer multiples of pi divided by a. And now I will just basically substitute the k by a kn. Okay, so k1, I'll just put 1 over here and there's a certain value of k. k2, I put a 2 over here and that is a certain value of k. But going back to what we started out with, this is the, the, the equation that we started out with when we solved out the Schrodinger equation. Right, and then now I'll just rewrite that as, okay, I'll write that as first, I'll put a kn over here, okay, because we now know that k only takes certain values. So kn, that will correspond to a certain energy value, that's why I'll put an en. Now, rearranging for En, because after all, we want to get the energy values, am I correct? So rearrange for En, I will get a h-bar squared divided by 2n kn squared, 
almost there. Now substitute the, the solutions to the Schrodinger equation where we apply the boundary conditions to this and I would get h bar squared. Okay, so h bar squared, I'll get a pi squared at the top divided by 2m a squared at the bottom and a n squared where n is equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, so on and so forth. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the discrete energy values for the problem, which is the unsymmetric infinite square value. Who would have thought, you know, it would have linked up by the solutions of a sine equation? Now, classical, we know no restrictions for energy. So classical energy, energy values. But now we know that in the quantum picture, we get the discrete energy values. And again, this discrete energy values is a consequence of this bound state solution. Because the bound state solution, particle confined inside here, the theorem tells us we will get a discrete energy spectrum. And then now we have just shown conclusively by solving the Schrodinger equation, applying bound states that the energy values are in fact discrete.